think I'm on? Yep. I'm on. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, somebody say praise the Lord. I just, uh, it is just my uh, privilege and honor again to be before you. As I said last month, I have been in this congregation many times with, you know, witnessing and hearing guest speakers, and I've been blessed tremendously. But I count it as a privilege to have myself be put on Pastor Yeager's heart to be part of this great revival. Amen? And I, I, I personally believe that great, great things are happening in the spirit. I really do. I personally believe that. I thank God for the church growth that's happening here. I thank God for the signs and wonders and miracles that are happening here. I thank God for what's happening in other churches who are part of this as they go back and take back what they've gotten here and what they've imparted here as they take it back. I just thank God that the Spirit of God is moving. And for those of you that are faithful, I just, I just believe that aside from your financial seeds that, are, that you're sowing, your, your seeds of faithfulness will not go unnoticed with the Lord. Amen? As a matter of fact, I believe that there are great and mighty blessings for you. I really do. So, sir, I, 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 again, I just... I'm just happy to be part of revival. Revival now, in Jesus' name. I'm just happy about it. Amen? I, uh, I also love the topics, like I said before, that, that uh, Dr. Yeager, uh, that was laid on his heart. And uh, you can't, it's interesting because I know a lot of people that love, that absolutely love <laughs> the deep things of the, of the Lord, the deep things of the Word. But sometimes when you go back to the basics, when you go back to the basics, you'd be surprised how deep and how heavy it can be. And oh, by the way, you know, the, the word is quick and it's alive and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. So even, even some of the most quoted scriptures that you hear all the time can be deep. I mean, if, for example, and we're going to go there, believe it or not, to John 3.16. And I know we can all quote it, but we're going to read it. We're going to read it and we're going to try to break it down a little bit. But it's interesting to me, you can take John 3.16 and get a ton of different messages from it. I've got messages, I've heard messages on giving, sowing, reaping, the blood, you name it, from just John 3.16. You know, you, messages on the harvest, the lost, you name it. But the bottom line is, that's the Father's heart. And this month, like I said earlier, I just love the topics, September, Jesus, you know, October, God the Father, November, the Holy Spirit, and then, of course, December, the church. I think that's just, I just love that. So we're just going to talk about the Father tonight, if that's okay with you. And, uh, you know, we're just going to see what the Holy Ghost does. Amen? Let's bow our heads and pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the precious name of Jesus, and we come giving you all the glory, the honor, the praise. Father God, I thank you for the spirit of revival. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your plan of redemption. I thank you that you sent your son Jesus as our Redeemer and our soon-coming King. And I thank you, Father God, for the precious Holy Spirit, for without him we could do nothing as we ought to do it. Without him, we can know nothing as we ought to know it. So right now, I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your manifest presence in this house. I thank you that you've been here, and I just ask for more of your presence right now. More of your presence, Lord. I ask for the hovering and the power of the Holy Spirit over this house right now. And I ask that you just prepare every ear to hear and every heart to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let's go to John 3.16. Let's go to John 3.16. And like I said, I know we can all quote it, but let's just, let's just look at some things. And, and I just think that there's some things in, in 316 and even 17 that we take for granted. And I know this message is all about the Father, but the bottom line is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the church. And I like to say the triumphant church. That's us. If you're part of the triumphant church, raise your hand and give a great shout to the Lord. Amen. Let me, let me get two hallelujahs. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are the triumphant church, irregardless of what it looks like, irregardless of what stats say, irregardless of what, what naysayers say, we are triumphant. Because the bottom line is, when we look at ourselves in the mirror, which is Romans through Jude, that's how God sees us as the body of Christ. That's, that's our covenant, Romans through Jude. And when we look at that, that's like looking in the mirror. That's who we are. So irregardless of what, 
what everybody else says, we are champions in God's eyes. Amen? Romans through Jude, that is our covenant. That's the mirror we look into. That's who he says we are. Now, here's what God the Father is saying in John 3.16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He so loved the world that he gave. Yeah, Brother Tone, I know. We quote it all the time. I hear it all the time. Yes, yes, yes. But guess what? What you have to understand is he loved the world so much. Loved that, that world we discuss all the time. That world, oh, by the way, that we came out of. That world that, let's just be honest, disgusts us sometimes. Oh, I don't want to go over there. They're cussing and drinking over there. I don't want to go over there. They're doing this, that, and the other. Yeah, they are. That's the world. That's what they're supposed to do. It's up to us to redeem them back. And guess what? God's plan was to get them back. He loved them so much that he sent Jesus to shed his blood to redeem them back. See, he gave his only begotten son. He has millions of angels, or he has millions of stars. He has millions of planets that he could have gave. He, he didn't give something that he had plenty of. He gave something he only had one of. He only had one son. And he gave that son to get us back. He gave that son as a seed to harvest back a family. And see, the Lord Jesus said it in John 5, 17. He says, my father work hither unto, now I work. Or my father work up until now, I work. What's he doing? What's the work? Redeeming the family back to the kingdom of God. How'd he do it? Preaching the gospel and healing. Preaching the gospel and healing. Preaching the gospel and healing. Preaching in the streets, teaching in the synagogue, and healing. That's what he did. He's the head of the church. Therefore, we are the body. We're to be doing the same thing. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't give an angel. He didn't give us one of the stars. He didn't give us a galaxy. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But for God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but through him that the world might be saved. And see, that's the biggest lie that the adversary had sold the world. And you and I, thank God, the blinders are off. See, we were part of that mess too, but we've come out from among them through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the blood of Jesus. See, the biggest lie is, oh, oh you know, Christianity, Jesus came to condemn. No, 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 no. He came to save them. And that's the message we need to get out. The Father's heart is love. He's not this great, big, angry old father. When I was a kid growing up in church, I used to have pictures of God being this great, big, angry father sitting on the throne with a long, gray beard just ready to whack somebody when he got out of line. That's not him. That's not him. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that he may get you, me, you, 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 all of us. Again, he could have gave a whole lot of different things, but he gave his son. Why? So that the world might be saved, not condemned. He didn't send his son in the world to condemn the world at all. And that's the lie straight from the pit of hell that they think that the adversary has them believing. We have to take the love of the Father to the lost and dying world. Amen? That's our job. And as I said before, I love these titles, but they seem to intermingle. We're talking about the Father, but here it is, the church, but that because we're family. We're family. And see, I know this is a very, I know this is a very familiar scripture, and I'm going to give you more familiar scriptures, but sometimes we've got to get back to the basics and see, listen, the bottom line is you don't start building any kind of structure without a foundation. This building was not started with the roof first. The house I live in was not started with roof first. Oh, it may have been, if it was a prefab home, it might have been built, the roof might have been done first, but it wasn't put on until the foundation was set, Amen. You've got to have the foundation, and the basics are the foundation. Amen? Let's go to Luke 15. Luke 15. Real familiar verses, but sometimes I think we always, we just need to go there to refresh and understand. We're talking about the love of the Father. Amen? Luke 15. And Jesus said, if you want to know what the Father's like, look at me. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And guess what? Jesus said, I and the Father are one. If Jesus is on the right hand of the Father, but yet in us, then we and the Father are one. See, he cannot be the head of the church, and then we be the body, and we're going in two different directions, doing two different things. As he is, so are we in this world. Amen. See, and the bottom line is simply this. It started with Jesus. It started with God the Father, then Jesus, then 12, then 11, then 120, and it exploded. Amen? To us today. Amen? 
So Luke 15, and we'll start at verse 1. And we'll go through this verse by verse. Again, I know you've heard this before. The prodigal son, I mean, between John 3.16 and the prodigal son, you probably heard them since you were in Sunday school. I get it. But I'm telling you, there's things sometimes that just jump out at you and say, wow, I forgot about that, or gee whiz, I didn't know that. Amen? Verse 1 says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans, or all the tax collectors and sinners, to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receives or he welcomes sinners, and he eats with them. Now, you've got to understand that verse right there. See, you've got to look at this. This is a parable of the prodigal son, and it has a dual meaning, if you will. It has a natural meaning, and it has a spiritual meaning. So when we get to the prodigal son in verse 11, he's setting it up here with the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin. What you have to understand is he's talking about God the Father. He's talking about someone who was in the kingdom but was lost and now found has come back. And they're talking about religious-minded people. So he's saying, listen, the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, this man receives, he welcomes sinners, and eats with them. And he spake on this parable, saying, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after them which is lost and find it? Who wouldn't do that? And he that founds it lays on his shoulders and rejoices, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his family, and he says, look, let's, let's, let's rejoice. I, my, my sheep was lost, now it's found. And verse 7 says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner. Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner more than over the 99 just persons or the righteous which need no repentance. Every time, the Father's heart is simply this. Every time someone who is lost, who he sent Jesus to shed his blood for, every time that person, that person comes to Christ, all of heaven rejoices. All the hosts of heaven rejoices. When you got saved, you got saved. When all of us in here got saved, heaven rejoiced. See, some people, when they get saved, they cry, they quake, they shiver. Some just stand there and smile. Some, you know, you don't see anything physically at all. But I'm telling you, spiritually, there is a party going on in heaven. Amen? And that's what he's trying to say. Listen, who of you would have 99, 100 sheep and, wouldn't, and, you know, one is lost and you wouldn't go find him? And when you come back, you say, great, let's celebrate. I found the one that was lost. Now he's found. Let's party. Let's celebrate. Right? Verse 8 says, and keep in mind, 7 says, all of heaven rejoices when a lost sinner repents. When someone who's in the world repents, that's the Father's love. Verse 8 says, either that woman having ten pieces of silver, ten silver coins, if she loses one piece, does she not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, rejoice with me for I have found the piece which I have lost. Verse 10 again says, likewise, this is Jesus talking again now, in red, likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner, just one, that repents. And I've heard this all my Christian life, and I believe it to be true. If there was only one person on earth lost at the time Jesus came, he would have came to hang on the cross for that one person. I really believe that with all my heart. I really believe that. So the bottom line is the Father and all of heaven rejoice when a lost person comes to the kingdom of God. But what about that person who's already in the kingdom and chooses to stray away? What about that person? Verse 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of thy goods that falls to me. And he divided unto them his living, his livelihood, his inheritance. Now we read over that and we think, okay, the son wanted his goods. He wanted to travel away. He wanted to go live in all kinds of crazy living. And we just let that go. What we have to understand is, again, there's spiritual meanings to this. And there's a natural meaning. So this story is about a natural father and a natural son who got into all kind of crazy living, as we'll see, and as you know, and then another son who was unforgiving. But it's also a spiritual story of God the Father, how he treats and how he welcomes those who were with him coming back home. It's called repentance. And how he also says to ones who are already there with a religious mindset, I loved you and you're with me all along. Don't you get it? Don't you see it? So, so you've got to understand. But see, from a natural standpoint, in this parable, you've got to understand. This, this, this verse right here says, The younger of them says to his father, Give me the portion of my goods that falls to me. You've got to understand, in the Jewish culture, he wouldn't have got this at all. So this shows the father's love right here, just the father giving him his portion. He wouldn't have gotten his portion at all until the father died. So there's two sons. And instead of when the father passes... If he would have passed half and half, the older son would have got two-thirds in the Jewish culture. So what he's saying is, I can't wait, Dad, for you to pass away. I want my inheritance now. That's what he's saying. So that's disrespectful right there. 
You have to get that in the natural. That's disrespectful. Yet in love, the father says, fine, son. You may See, he made us free will beings, did he not? See, he's not going to force himself or his kingdom on any of us. See, see, if that's the case, in the garden, he, he told Adam, listen, of all these trees you can freely eat, just don't eat that one. So whenever the fruit was in Eve's hand and she passed off to Adam, did God say in Genesis, put down that fruit? Did he, did he do that? No. Free will. They were given their instructions. The rest is up to us. We either obey or we don't. Amen? So, so, so the bottom line is simply this. <laughs> he was lovingly enough to give him his inheritance. He gave it to him, right? And it says, and not, and verse 13 says, and not many days after, the younger son gathered together all and took his journey into a far country, and there he wasted his substance, his inheritance, on riotous living, prodigal living. He, he spent it all. So you got to understand now, the, the whole family estate is now one-third less than what it was. Thank God it wasn't one half. See, because the older son would have got two-thirds at time of death. Now the whole family estate is one-third gone. You got to get that. One-third gone. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. So now he, he went and he wasted it all. Meanwhile, back at home, they're not as, as prosperous, gross or net-wise, as they were. Yet the father loved him and said, go ahead, son. If that's what you want to do, you go ahead. You go ahead. See, he, he, he just let him walk with it with his own free will. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and sent him into his fields to, to feed swine. Again, culturally speaking, you have to understand, if Jesus is telling this parable, he would have to be telling it from the Jewish culture. Amen? So the bottom line is simply this. This young guy who took his, took his inheritance before his father passed away out of greed and out of disrespect, and oh, by the way, the father gave it to him when he had every right to rebuke him. You've got to understand, he had every right to rebuke him. He loved him, gave it to him. Now he spends it all, and now he's in a foreign land, and he joined up, hooked up with somebody else in another country, and they put him to work feeding pigs. Number one, that's degrading because Jews considered pigs swine unclean. So you got to see here, he would have gladly have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, but no man gave unto him. See, 15 said he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country. Then he said he would have gladly have filled his belly with what the pigs were eating, but nobody gave him anything. So the bottom line is simply this. It's degrading enough, in his opinion, to be feeding and herding and taking care of pigs as a Jewish boy. That's number one. Number two, the pigs that are so unclean were eating better than him. Number three, the pigs were eating better than him, and no one else gave him anything to eat. There was plenty of food and husk for the pigs, none for him. None. Then he says, when I come, and when he had come to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, but yet I perish with hunger? He came to himself. He came to his senses. He realized he had a revelation of the royalty that he was that he left. He had a revelation of his royalty, who he was. You've got to understand, again, it's a, it's a parable about a natural family with spiritual implications, spiritual meanings. So he's in, just like the sinner who backslides. I'm sorry, just like the saint, the Christian who backslides, and whether or not, we all know, we all know, and we've seen the stories, we've heard the stories, whether they're in jail, whether they're out in the streets using drugs, whether they're hooked on gambling at the racetrack. We've all heard the testimonies that somebody sat there and said, you know what, I hit rock bottom and it hit me. I'm sitting in that prison cell, and it hit me. Gee whiz, you know, I gave all, all that up to come to this, and this is where I had to land. See, the bottom line is simply this. Jesus is the only Savior. And see, a lot of times these people end up in these situations, and the first thing they want to do is reach out to family members. And family members seem to come through sometimes. A lot of times they do, but what family members have to understand is they are not Jesus. We are to be Christ-like, but we are not Christ. See, because he was the Savior, and the Savior got crucified. If we keep bailing people out of jail, if we keep giving people money and enabling them when they hit rock bottom instead of giving them the gospel. See, Jesus never went around handing out money and paying bills, but he did pray, and he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is here. In other words, he's telling the poor, blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. What's he saying? He wasn't saying, oh, bless you, brother. God bless you. You know, you're going to get it all in a sweet by and by. He said, no, you don't have to be poor anymore because now you can be hooked up with the kingdom. And there is abundance in God's kingdom, the Father's kingdom. There is abundance. So he wasn't saying that, oh, you're blessed because you're poor. He's saying, 
Blessed are ye poor, because now the kingdom of heaven is here. So all these people that hit rock bottom, when they come to their senses, they come to realize who they are, what they left in Jesus. Therefore, the word of God can set them free. All they got to do is repent. Amen? That's all they got to do. He says in verse 18, I will rise and go to my father. Now here's the repentance. And I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no more worthy, or I'm, not, I'm no longer worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of the hired servants. Okay, now here's the guilt and shame setting in. Because, see, all he has to do is repent. But see, it's guilt and shame. I'm no longer worthy to be your son, oh God. I'm no longer worthy. Just let me be a servant. But see, we all know the father's response. So it says in verse 20, he arose and came to his father, but when he is yet a great far way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Here's what the Bible doesn't say. We have no idea. No idea how long this situation went. Was it days? Was it weeks? Was it months? Was it years? We know though that the father saw him afar off, ran and kissed him. So that tells me, that tells you that the father was looking for him and waiting for him every day. And what you also have to understand in this tradition, in this culture, that the father, being an older man, would not have ran naturally. But we're talking about the father's love. This is a picture of God the father welcoming back the sinner, welcoming back the one who was in the fold, was a brother in Christ, and welcoming back with open arms like nothing ever happened because of the power of repentance. That's the Father's love. Amen? And it says, He ran and had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the Son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, that's repentance, and in thy sight I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Of course, we know what the Father says. It says, The Father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. That's what he said. Here's what the world would say. I can't believe you ran off like that and spent all the money. Now our estate is down one-third. We're not as big as we used to be. You know your mother was worried sick. You embarrassed us. I can't believe you did that. That's what the world would say. I can't believe you're out there drinking and smoking crack and acting a fool and doing all that. Now you want to come back and ask for forgiveness? I should slap you in the next week. I, sh I, I have every right not to forgive you. That's what the world would say. Christians wouldn't do that, amen? But here's what they would do. Well, son, you know what? I, 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 I tell you, yes, I, 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 we missed you. I love you. We forgive you. Son, we forgive you, but why, why did you do that? You put your mother through so much pain. Why did you do that, son? Oh, oh yes, yeah, son, we, we forgive you. And you know what? Yeah, we, we, we love you. You're always going to be our son, but... Oh, my gosh, now we're down. We, we don't, we, our, our net and, 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 and gross is down one-third. You really put us in a pickle, and it was so embarrassing all around town. Son, why did you do that to us? Why did you do, would Christians do that? Would Christians do that? <laughs> so you say no. <laughs> would Christians do that? I think they would. I've heard, I've heard parents talk like that. But God says, the Father, the Father's love says, put a robe on him, put a ring on his finger, and put sandals on his feet. What does the robe mean? The robe signifies dignity and honor. He was out there in all that mess. He was out there gambling, drinking, cussing, smoking, selling drugs, using drugs, all that mess that, that happens today. Yet when he comes back to repent, God says, look, I will throw all your sins in the sea of forgiveness. I have separated them as far as the east is to the west. I have totally forgiven you. You say you repent, you don't even have to. It, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. Get a robe. Get a robe on him, and it, and it signifies dignity and honor. We're giving your dignity back. We're giving your honor back. Put a ring on his finger. That means authority. We're giving you your authority back. Put shoes on his feet. Put sandals on his feet. What does that mean? It means you're not a servant. See, in that culture, servants didn't wear shoes. Even though a lot of servants lived well and did well, they did not wear shoes. So the shoes signified that he was not a servant. In other words, he was back home. And 23 says, bring here the fatted calf. This is the father now. Bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. What is that? The fatted calf was the, was the animal fit for a feast, fit for a grand celebration. Just like he said, who has 99 sheep and wouldn't go after the one and then call all your friends together and celebrate? Who wouldn't do that? But what woman wouldn't, wouldn't uh, uh, find the one coin and call everybody and celebrate? All the hosts of heaven are celebrating when one comes back home. He's saying, let's have a party. Someone, my son was lost, now he's found, let's have a party. 
And see, what I'm trying to tell you is this is the Father's heart. This is the Father's love. This is why he sent his son. This is why we're still here. Because we are to do what, as the body of Christ, we're to do what the head would be doing if he was still on the earth. And that's what he did. That's what he meant by up until now, I work. My father works up until now, I work. What was he talking about when he said my father works? He wasn't talking about creation. Creation was done back in Genesis. He's talking about redeeming the family back. And see, that's what the father's love is all about. He said, look, go kill the fatted calf and let's eat and be merry. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he's found. And they began to be married. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came back, he called one of the servants and he says, look, what's going on? What's all the ruckus at the house? What's all the celebration? And the servant says something very interesting. He says, look, your brother was lost. Now he's found. He was dead. Now he's alive. That's what the celebration is all about. But the older brother was angry, verse 28 says. He was angry, and he would not go in and, 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 and fellowship. He would not go in to take part in the celebration. What's that symbolic of? It's symbolic of verse 2. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, this man receives, he welcomes sinners. See, that's, that's a religious, pompous, pious, self-righteous attitude. You have God the Father, the Father, saying, yes, son, I forgive you, welcome back. Matter of fact, he didn't even have any conversation. He said, go get the robe, the ring, and the shoes. It's a done deal. You repent it, that's all I need to hear. But yet the son catches an attitude, a spirit of religion, a spirit of self-righteousness, okay? Now, what you have to understand is this. He wouldn't go in. So verse 29 says to his father, the, the oldest son says, Lo, these many years I served thee, neither transgressed at any time thy commandment, yet you never gave me a kid or a goat, that I may make merry with my friends. He's saying, look, I've done everything you ever asked me to do, all that you've ever asked me to do, and yet you never even gave me goat burgers that my friends and I could have a party. Yet, now look, watch this now. He says, but as soon as thy son, as soon as thy son, as soon as thy son, not as soon as my brother, because see, that's where his heart was now. He's no longer my brother. He went out and did all this mess. I disown him. Guess what? If the father didn't, we shouldn't. He's saying, as soon as thy son comes home, not as soon as my brother comes home, as soon as thy son comes home, you want to get kill the fatted calf and have a great big party, but I can't even get goat burgers, and I've served you all this time. What you have to understand is simply this. If, let's say, for example, that the older son came up out of the fields and he's over there. The house is over there where they're having a good time. They're celebrating the lost. Come home. The natural father and the son who repented is there. The natural son who, who's acting like a religious, pious, pompous, self-righteous, you know what? He's over there. The house is there. He's there. God the Father symbolically is there in the house, correct? The son who repented symbolically, the backslider, the sinner, is in the house, correct? They are what? Fellowshipping with one another, correct? They are in fellowship. The oldest son who's in unforgiveness, he's over here. He's not there. So he's not in fellowship. Am I right about it? So here's my point. When we refuse, especially when one comes back home, when we turn our nose up at, look down at, go direct, diabolically opposed to what the father thinks and feels to a sinner coming back home, when we refuse fellowship with our brother like he did, because the father's there too, then we're refusing fellowship with the father. When we refuse fellowship with our brother who has returned home, and many of us can think of a whole lot of people who are out there doing a whole lot of mess who left the church backslidden, and then they come back, and a lot of people look down on them and don't want to treat them the same way, and they look at them different. When we refuse fellowship with our brother, then we're refusing fellowship with the Father. Amen? Now, now, now some of the Bible th theologians may say this. Well, yeah, Brother Tone, I was with you, and I get you there. I hear what you're saying, but my Bible tells me that God is all-present, all-knowing, all-powerful. He's everywhere. So if he's in the house, he's also over here. True. He is. But I said fellowship. See, the sin of unforgiveness, all you got to do is go read Mark 11, 25 and 26. It talks about, 22 through 26 talks about the prayer of faith. But yet all that's irrelevant. 22 through 24 is irrelevant if you do not forgive. If you do not forgive, your prayers will not be answered. First Peter, is it 3, 1 through 7? talks about how husband and wife should be on one accord and, and, and strife will hinder their prayers. I want to say it's 1 Peter. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. 
uh, you theologians out there. First Peter 3, 1 through 7, I think. But anyhow, the bottom line is the sin of, of unforgiveness, bitterness, cuts you off. So what am I saying? The father's in there. The other son's in there. The other son's over here unforgiving. He's not in fellowship. Even if God is all present, and he is, God is standing there, mum. Until that older son changes his heart, God the Father's mum. There's no fellowship. Amen? So you've got to understand the Father's heart. It is to totally forgive. It is to totally forgive. And this is one of the most uh, taught parables ever. But yet it's something that I think a lot of times the church has gotten away from. See, you know, I may have said this the last time, and, and, and if I did, I apologize, but I'll say it again. We have to understand, if we want a big bad sinner punished, don't bring him to Jesus. Just don't bring him to Jesus. Because the woman who was caught in adultery, he was the only one that had a Bible right to stone her. Because he was the only one that was without sin. He said, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. From the oldest to the youngest, they started walking away. Guess what? He was the only one that was sinless. He had a right to stone her. He had the authority. He had the, the you know, he had the okay to do it based on what he said. Guess what? He chose to forgive her. So big bad sinners, don't bring them to Jesus. Because he's going to forgive them. He's not going to stone them. Amen? So the Father's love is that simple. And verse 31 says, And he said unto him, Son, you are ever with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And that is the bottom line, church. That's, that's, that's the heart of the Father's love right there. The bottom line is simply this. He sent his son Jesus into the world so he can redeem his family back. He planted, I've heard it said, he sowed his son as a seed to reap the harvest called the family of God. The kingdom of God, the family of God, that is us, the church. That's the bottom line. He, he, he loved the world so much that he gave something he only had one of, not something he had plenty of, one of. And the bottom line is simply this. Jesus said, I and the Father are one, and Jesus is in us. We are the church, so guess what? We ought to be doing the same thing. That is the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. All the world. And see, that's why I love this revival right here. This is sparking fires. This is kindling fires. This is setting sparks. This is just, uh, I'm telling you, I'd love to see this happen all over the world at the same time. Yeah, I know there's Brownsville here, and there's Toronto there, and 100 years ago it was Azusa Street, and it's, it's, it's really kind of sad that we can name these on a few hands, these great revivals, because it should be spreading like wildfire all the time. See, that's why I believe, and again, I'm getting ahead of myself in a totally different month, but that's why I believe the church is asleep. The most powerful institution on the face of the earth is you and I coming together as the triumphant church. Why? Because we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We're children of God. We can't lose. We cannot lose. We cannot lose. But yet we're letting the world dictate how things should be. And the bottom line is simply this. We need to be setting the standard of how things should be. We have the anointing. See, see in Isaiah 9, 6, it talks about the government of God. We look at it as a Christmas scripture. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government should be on his shoulders. That government is a brand new kingdom. See, God the Father sent Jesus in here to bring a brand new kingdom, not to tweak the kingdoms that are already here, not to fix them and edit them, to wipe them out and replace them. Wipe them out and replace them. See, and that government's on his shoulders. If he's the word made flesh, and that government is carried by the word. See, every other government should be tied into the government of God. They're trying to do things on the face of this earth without the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the power of God. They're trying to do it without God, and it is not working. And see, I don't care what political party it is. They don't have the answer if they don't have Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. I side with the Bible. I vote Bible. I don't vote party. I don't vote race. I side with the Lord. But the bottom line is simply this. There will be no peace till the Prince of Peace comes. But in the meantime, we occupy till he comes. And see, our duties as Christians, our duties as, listen, <laughs> oh my, I just, I, just, I just heard this. If we're spiritual Israel, and we are, amen, then why would we support somebody who doesn't support Israel? I'm going to vote for you, but you don't support me because I'm spiritual. We need to wake up. We need to wake up.
forgive me for the political soapbox, but we need to, we need, Christians need to be Christian. If there is, see, I understand this is Gettysburg. I understand this is Adams County. It's not Harlem. It's not Watts in L.A. It's not South Side Chicago. It, it's not even 6th Street in Allison Hill in Harrisburg. But I'm telling you right now, if there is a drug problem in your town or in your city, if there's a murder problem, if there's a gambling, whatever the spirit is, if there's a problem, it's the church's problem because the church has the answer. Amen? The Father's love. We can never forget it. Yeah, I know. This has been taught a million times and taught plenty of times better than I did it. But the bottom line is simply this. We have to understand who he is, why he sent his son, and what we're here to do while, listen, occupy till he comes. What did he do? Redeem the family back. We got to really examine ourselves and see are we doing a good job of it. See, he is put, and I'll stop with this. God the Father is the chief visionary. He sent his son Jesus with the vision. And under that chief visionary, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, you have what I believe are sub-visionaries, the five-fold ministry gifts. And God has given all them a mission and a vision, and it should always have to do with the lost, always. See, Dr. Yeager may do it differently than, than prophet so-and-so, than apostle so-and-so, than pastor so-and-so, than evangelist so-and-so, but it should always be, always be that mission that's been given to the sub-visionaries, the, the five-fold ministry gifts, the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, and evangelist, that should always be about the lost. From the time in the garden when God said, I tell you what, I'm going to put an enemy between uh, your seed, Satan, and the woman's seed, and he, he spoke it then. That was the mission and the vision. Since then, he's been working on redeeming the family back. He had to find a man who can come in covenant with Abraham, so on and so forth, right up into the New Testament. The bottom line is, it's exploded into what we call the church now. And we are anointed to do what Jesus did. We just got to realize who we are in him, who he is in us, and whose sons we are. Not, not, not who we are in us, who we are in him. Amen? Well, can everybody stand, please, and give the Lord a hand of praise. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you. We praise you. We thank you for what you've done tonight. We thank you for this great and mighty revival. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that you desire to redeem your family back to you. Father God, that is the sole purpose that you sent your son. You sent your son that you love so much, your only begotten son, to redeem somebody back just like me. So, Lord, I thank you and I praise you. And, Father God, I just speak over this revival now. Father, I thank you for the fires that are set forth. I thank you for the ministry gifts that are coming to, to, to impart into your people. I thank you that your people are receiving and taking it out into the communities, into their jobs, into the workplaces, their neighborhoods. And I thank you that fires are starting everywhere, Lord. I thank you, Father God, for what you desire to do in this region, in this county, in Gettysburg, in Chambersburg, Briggerville, Cashdown. I thank you, Father God. And I thank you that it is spiraling. It is spiraling and rolling downhill like a great big ball of fire. Lord, I just thank you so much for this man. I thank you for this ministry. I thank you for this house. I thank you for Dr. Yeager and what you've called him to do, Father. And I give you all the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is there anyone here who wants or needs prayer for anything? Are we still doing this? Anybody here who wants or needs prayer for anything? Anybody at all, please come forth. Anybody who wants or needs prayer for anything, hallelujah, amen, glory, glory, glory. Anybody wanting or need prayer for anything, just uh, please come forth. Hallelujah. You go ahead, sir. I don't want to. You know, the word will not return void, and it, does ma it doesn't really matter how many people are in this facility. Really, we're doing this all by faith, and we know it's going out, and, and uh even, you know, if you visit our YouTube channel, I mean, we've had over 43,000 visits. Here we are in a little community out in the pasture field, basically. 43,000 people have watched our videos. I mean, praise the Lord. Now, I'm sure some of them are repeats, but still, I mean, still the word of God's going out. And uh, so, uh, I mean, right now, even by live streaming and so uh, I, I'm excited. I'm excited. And people who are hungry, they're going to come. Just got to give it a little bit of time. 
when you plant seed in the ground, you don't go out there the next morning and dig it back up, do you? It might take, it might take a day, two days, a week before you see a little sprout. Amen? And then, there, and then it grows and it grows. I remember in the spring, they plant all this corn and it's nothing but dirt fields. But by the end of the year, there's all this corn and all this weed. Amen. Amen. So we're going to pray and believe God for you.